Hi, Todd here from Urban Sound Studio, and today we are talking about treatment and acoustics in studio environments. Now, right off the bat, I want to admit, I am not an acoustician, but I've spent years around professionals picking up tricks, talking about what to do, and maybe even more importantly, what not to do when it comes to acoustics. I want to begin by debunking some myths, talking about some terminology. I'll share with you what's worked for me and hopefully save you some money along the way. Let's start with a term that really irks me, and that's the term soundproofing. Obviously, it doesn't make sense. We're working with sound. We're not trying to soundproof. But what are people talking about? Usually, this applies in home studio environments. And what people are talking about is isolation. They want isolation either from the outside world or they want to make sure that their creative space is contained within that creative space and not bleeding out into the outside world. Well, the bad news here is that you can add all of the egg crate foam or generic sound panel kits you want around the room and probably do nothing to help with isolation. In actuality, if your objective is isolation, you are going to need to think about density. If you are dealing with just sheetrock, you are going to have quite a battle. The best option for most people would be sand poured cinder block with a decoupled floor. But I know that's not realistic. So our other alternatives are to think about density in terms of what we do have. We can alternate plywood over our sheetrock and then add a second layer of sheetrock. We can look at products such as quiet rock. But then we also need to think about any place where air is moving within the room. And that could be AC units, or it could be small cracks around windows or any place where air is getting in. The reality is that each gap of air or place where sound can enter could be substantial no matter how small. And the cumulative effect of having several of these flanking paths, as we call them, could be equal to recording with a window that's open. So what do we need to do? If isolation is your objective, then pause for a moment with the egg crate foam and let's start thinking about density. Also, find and eliminate those places where air can travel where you don't want air to travel. And please, for the sake of sounding a bit more knowledgeable, stop using the term soundproof. So let's talk about that egg crate foam or generic sound panels. Typically, those products are intended to reduce high frequencies or to help with reflections. The problem is most of us aren't dealing with those problems as the majority of our problems. For the most part, we're dealing with either low frequency buildup, mid frequency reflections, sometimes high frequencies, but it's not that we just want to kill off those high frequency reflections. Actually, in doing that, we might actually make a room sound worse. Now, there are places that we can benefit from this type of foam and treatment. One would be to help control first reflections on the sides of our control room or listening area. For me, these products help you eliminate comb filtering and slap style delays. But notice they aren't everywhere. They're only on the sides and on the ceiling to help me control those first reflections. Another place I look to control reflections is in my live room. Here, these coffee bag style panels are placed in areas where reflections were noticeable for the live performing musicians. But note that this product made by the company ATS is actually made from a wooden frame and filled with rock wool. It's pretty good quality. And what's the benefit of it looking like a coffee panel? Honestly, it's to look cool. Let's remember, while we are dealing with acoustics, there is a certain vibe that we're trying to get in our creative space and aesthetics is a big part of that. Ever see one of these things? Of course you have. The general idea is it's supposed to improve the sound of a microphone. In theory, you're supposed to place the microphone here and it improves the sound. But the problem is most people use this device with a cardioid mic. And the absorptive material behind the mic is placed where the mic is already receiving off-axis rejection of sound. So in theory, it's actually not doing that much. I've actually pointed out to several people that by placing a unit like this above a microphone, you could actually do more good because you'll end up canceling out any reflections off the ceiling. But we know people aren't going to do that. Now, this device can be useful when used with omnidirectional mics that can be picking up reflections behind or even bi-directional microphones. 
I will admit that I've used them on guitar cabinets when I've had several guitar cabinets with a ribbon microphone in front and the guitar cabinets had no other place than to be next to each other. And they've helped a little bit with isolation there. But in general, they're not going to do too much for your sound. Instead, I turn to gobos. Let's take a look at what I'm talking about. I'm here with an artist playing live in front of an omnidirectional mic. There's absolutely no treatment, not even a rug underneath them. That's how love works on a broken heart. That's how dreams shine. You fall apart. That's how love works. You're all alone. That's how love works. Now let's listen again after I've added only a rug underneath the artist. That's how love works on a broken heart. That's how dreams shine. We'll fall apart. That's how love works. You're all alone. One by one, I'm going to start adding some sound panels around the artist. Listen to how it begins to tighten up the sound. One thing I can't get you to hear, but the artist can hear, is how much the sound improves to the artist as they're performing. The sound panels that I used in the last example were from a company called Pros Acoustic, and I want to give a shout out here because they do something unique. Now, first off, they can be mounted on a wall or they could be hung from a ceiling, or as you saw, they could be used in a gobo style with a stand. But for me, the real benefit is they combine absorption with diffusion. Now, the absorption is obvious. Just like any other panel, it reduces the sound that is being trapped. But what's unique is that behind the material is a textured surface that is engineered to make sure that any reflections back into the room come back at a different angle. This not only allows breakup in the reflected pattern to offer a more traditional diffusion, but it also makes sure that when reflected back, there's even more absorption taking place as it travels through the absorptive material at a different angle. Another thing I love about the Pro's Acoustic panels is how you can interchange their customizable covers. Let's see how quickly I could go from this podcast style office or living room look to a more traditional studio environment look. And now here we are with a completely different look and it just took a matter of seconds. While these panels really are mostly about acoustics, let's remember, aesthetics are always a part of our studio environment. I want to circle back to this idea of avoiding using the term soundproof. Instead, I want to encourage you to think in terms of isolation, absorption, and diffusion. In analyzing my control room, I found that I had significant bass buildup in the corners. These GIK bass traps help to capture much of the buildup. Balanced with a different style trap above, I found a way to help balance this room to fit my needs. I already mentioned the side walls and ceiling absorption for the first reflections. But if you look at the back wall behind my listening position, you can see I have a balance of some GIK panels right behind me for diffusion. The idea here is that I do not want to kill off all the reflections on the back wall, but instead help to make sure that they're dispersed in order to help balance the room. Next to the GRK panels, I begin alternating with some pros acoustic panels, as I found those help to give me a stronger balance of absorption and diffusion in one as I approach the corners of the room, which can get problematic. Now let's talk about our listening position in a room. You've probably all heard that we wanna make sure to sit in an equilateral triangle. 
Yes, this is a best practice, but there are some other considerations. Be careful of placing your monitors on a desk, as comb filtering can lead to frequency cancellations. You can mitigate this by pulling your monitors back behind the desk. Want to check if you're even getting comb filtering? Put a blanket down over your desk. If your sound improves or changes, your reflections off the desk were leading to cancellations. Last, I know this might not be financially available to everybody, but try to book some time with an acoustician if possible. You'll learn a ton. But if you can't, at least go out and take advantage of some of the new technology we have. DSP allows for room corrections that we didn't previously have in the past. I use the Neumann MA1 microphone monitoring alignment system with my monitors. The concept is easy. You take a few measurements in the room. The software identifies where the microphone reveals a sound that is inconsistent with what you should have received. And the DSP stores a correction to help you achieve the best corrective curves for your mixing. It also helps with soundstage and stereo imaging. To me, it's very well worth the expense to be able to tighten up your sound for accuracy. Thanks for watching. Let us know in the comments below what you're using for sound treatment within your room. And as always, please help support the channel by liking the video and hitting subscribe.